Good morning, everybody. It's a serene morning on the conference day of South Zone ISA conference hosted by Puducherry branch. And this is the time I am asked to discuss on oxygen supply and demand. We are all breathing in fresh air. The amount of oxygen, the percentage of it evolved over a period of millions of years and reached the present oxygen concentration. Breathe in, you are breathing in life. We are all familiar with this oxygen cascade, the oxygen tension or partial pressure from the atmosphere rolls down, down and down to the arterial blood, into the tissues and even up to the mitochondria. These terminologies are familiar with us. How oxygen gets transported? It can be either convection or diffusion. Convection is when a movement of oxygen happens within the circulation occurring through bulk transport or diffusion. We mean it passive movement of oxygen down a concentration gradient. Okay, here is how oxygen is taken up into the blood. You know the story from alveolus. If we zoom in further, you can find the respiratory membrane across which oxygen diffuses into the blood, into the blood cells, into the hemoglobin. The carbon dioxide diffuses out across the membrane simultaneously. So now, Oxygen is carried in the blood, bound to hemoglobin and dissolved in plasma and intracellular fluid. We know the structure of hemoglobin molecule with the iron atom inside it and its binding of oxygen, how much percentage of the available seats are occupied by um, the oxygen is indicated by our oxygen dissociation curve you always discuss about uh, when it is getting shifted to left, shifted to right, and the implications we know. Now regarding oxygen content, the oxygen content of arterial blood is the sum of oxygen bound to hemoglobin and oxygen dissolved in plasma. So arterial oxygen content equals bound oxygen plus dissolved oxygen. So this is the formula. CaO2 equals 1.31 into um, hemoglobin into saturation of oxygen plus the diffusion part 0.003 into partial pressure of arterial oxygen. Here you can note the uh, figure 1.31 which is known as the Huffner's constant. The directly measured maximum oxygen carrying capacity per gram of hemoglobin in ml oxygen per gram hemoglobin reduced from the theoretical maximum binding capacity of 1.39 ml oxygen per gram of hemoglobin due to the presence of abnormal hemoglobin species in vivo. Again, this is the formula. So if we calculate with the normal uh, values for an adult male, you can see it is very close to 20 ml per 100 ml of blood. Regarding oxygen delivery, it's a historical misnomer. Should we mention it as oxygen delivery or oxygen dispatch? Dispatch is uh, what we are uh, pushing into the circulation, sending to the target. But oxygen delivery is actually um, what the tissues take up. It's like the uh, courier vehicle of, uh, say, Amazon or Flipkart. It will carry everything in the wagon, but uh, when it delivers, the target site receives only a portion of it. That is our oxygen extraction or oxygen delivery proper. So how do we estimate the oxygen consumption or VO2 either by expired gases analysis or through reverse FIC method? You know the arterial oxygen content is 18 to 20 mLs per deciliter. Venous side is around 13 to 16 mLs per deciliter. 
So the difference is almost uh, 3 to 5 mL per deciliter. Here is the formula uh, to estimate the VO2. Coming to oxygen extraction ratio again, the percentage of oxygen consumed to that delivered is termed as the extraction ratio and the normal value is just around 25% only. Extraction ratios can be calculated in uh, one of the two ways I'm mentioning that and uh, oxygen delivery DO2 can be estimated by the formula given on the right side. SpO2 is also an important player when we consider these facts. Now we come to a bit more uh, closer look at uh, oxygen uh, demand supply. Let us see what exactly is critical DO2. Okay, normally changing oxygen needs of the body are easily met through the abundant basal flow and a variety of compensatory mechanisms. Say like increased stroke volume and heart rate, vascular redistribution and of blood flow, capillary recruitment, changes in hemoglobin binding affinity. So the point at which these compensatory mechanisms fail to meet tissue requirements has been termed the critical DO2 or anaerobic threshold. So let's try to make uh, more in sense into it we'll see the graphical representation of uh, critical DO2. Here is a plot of oxygen delivery against uh, oxygen consumption. So when the oxygen delivery reduces, oxygen consumption is almost balanced up to a point below that. It drastically falls down. And this turning point is termed as DO2 critical. So during the pink zone, it is supply dependent region and on the right hand side, the physiological side, it's supply independent region. This graph also uh, depicts clearly what exactly we mean by the anaerobic threshold. Now, if we measure the serum lactate up to a point, serum lactate uh, remains almost um, within normal limits and then it shoots up very fast when the body system uh, get into supply dependent zone. Okay, in critical uh, care, we discuss about uh, some pathological conditions where this relationship altogether is uh, deranged in states of pathological DO2 dependency. So you can see the uh, connection between DO2 and uh, VO2 changes drastically. So now uh, we usually tend to uh, produce a kind of supranormal oxygen delivery in an attempt to send more so that uh, at least uh, a bit more will be taken up. Um, should we follow this uh, uh, general notion is a questionable thing now. So here I would like to um, in uh, bringing your attention to a landmark paper by Ronco and colleagues. So they mentioned that uh, when comparing DO2 critical between septic and non-septic patients, no significant difference was noted in their paper. In these heavily sedated patients, the anaerobic threshold averaged 3.8 um, mLs per minutes per kg as against the um, control group 4.5 ml per kg respectively. So extraction ratios were also similar and approached those seen in exercising adults and patients with other forms of shock. So what do you um, infer from that? The increased lactate levels can be caused by deranged cellular metabolism. This can also uh, occur regionally or issues with convective oxygen transport. We cannot uh, generalize this. So the interventions to increase oxygen delivery to supranormal levels in critically ill patients in the hope of improving oxygen consumption may be inappropriate. Increased arterial lactate may not be a specific marker of tissue hypoxia in critically ill patients. You need to ensure adequate oxygen delivery in critically ill patients as judged by clinical findings of adequate global tissue perfusion. 
So much of the contemporary approach is based on achieving the hemodynamic dynamic goals such as mean arterial pressure and attempts to uh, stabilizing organ function, reducing lactate levels and uh, getting the SpO2 values within the acceptable limits. Now we go to uh, anesthesiologist's perspective, oxygen and anesthesia. Of course, we all agree oxygen is arguably the most widely used drug in anesthesia and acute hospital care in general. So where do we use? Of course, in the perioperative care, we use in critical care and in cardiac arrest resuscitation also, it has got its own uh, role as anesthesiologist. Avoidance of arterial hypoxemia through administration of inspired oxygen therapy is central to the practice of acute medicine, but you need to read through the sentence closely. Because I am going to discuss the case for more precise oxygen therapy. So what I mean to convey is uncontrolled administration of oxygen or deliberate prescription of a high FiO2 frequently results in hyperoxia rather than normoxia. Hyperoxia can cause direct harm through either oxidative stress or right in cardiovascular mechanisms like coronary vasoconstriction, reduced cardiac output, increased peripheral vascular resistance, etc. Okay, so this is the graph I would like to convey that message. The arterial oxygenation plotted against the harm, you can find the zone of... Uh, individualized uh, therapeutic target where you find uh, a normoxic region, hypoxic region and hyperoxic region. Our aim is to be in the normoxic region so that the harm will be minimal. Okay, this is the principle or the strategy. Precise control of arterial oxygenation or PCAO or you go for permissive hypoxemia where we accept levels of arterial oxygenation a bit lower than conventionally tolerated patients in order to minimize the harms of high oxygen concentration and aggressive mechanical ventilation. This graph will make this point more uh, clear. This is the graph I showed before, but during a permissive hypoxemia, or uh, you can say that uh, in the hypoxemic region, there is a bit of uh, climatization happening at the tissue level, body adjusts or lear learns to adjust to lesser oxygen levels. So there the harm part is becoming a plateau at the bottom and uh, we can target this zone additionally so that you will be in target. Okay, so the physiological tolerance of hypoxemia or acclimatization is the key and okay. Also, it is important to avoid the interventions that uh, pursue normoxia, which frequently uh, leads to hypoxemia that has to be avoided. So who gives uh, blood supply to the poor heart, which keeps on pumping right from the moment of your birth or even before that? So it is the coronaries. Coronary supply is different from systemic and pulmonary circulation because it gets uh, less supply during the time it works during systole and when it relaxes during diastole, it gets maximum uh, supply. So these are the factors affecting the myocardial oxygen supply demand. Perioperatively, we need to be cautious about these factors so that uh, we will be in target. So oxygenation during anesthesia, we discuss in terms of pre-oxygenation, how much FAO2 is required under anesthesia, various oxygen therapy devices, Special situations we discuss while we discuss on myocardial oxygen supply demand, the cerebral protection, why hypothermia is uh, deleterious, why shivering is important for anesthesiologists. All these are important. When it comes to para-oxygenation, a uh, word of uh, uh, word requires to be uh, put here because it involves various methods of providing uh, oxygen during attempts to secure airway as anesthesiologists face in a day-to-day -day basis. It can be uh, different methods, including our HFNC, Thrive, or non DSAT. And uh, oxygenation is a continuum. We need to be worried about the safe apnea period, the green zone. You should always try to be in the green zone. The margin of safety dictates your efficiency. 
so the discussion will continue okay so i uh, give uh, my sincere thanks to the organizers the scientific committee to uh, extend or offer a chance for me to uh, speak in this august forum uh, we'll see in the q and a session later on uh, it's goodbye from dr sanish thank you